So unless you've been living underneath a rock, you've probably heard how the hypothesis that COVID came from a lab in Wuhan has gone from being classed as a fringe conspiracy theory to mainstream media acceptance and maybe now even the dominant perspective. The chance that this was created in a lab, there's an investigation. A chance? The disease is the same name as the lab. So this is an epic story and it's hugely important for what it shows about some of the most important topics we've been covering on the channel. The difficulty of sense making, the deliberate corruption of the information landscape by powerful actors, how consensus is created and defended, and the collapse into certainty on all sides. So I've been working on a piece about the lab leak for Rebel Wisdom since about February, trying to interview people from either side, someone who thought it was a lab leak and others who didn't. For some strange reason, as I'll explain later in this piece, I found it really difficult to get people who didn't think it was a lab leak to appear. In this piece, I'll try and summarize where the debate is at now and hear from some key people involved in how the story's developed, including Yuri Dagan of the decentralized collective called Drastic that uncovered so much of the new evidence. We as Drastic feel vindicated that our research is finally being noticed and really the things that we've been talking about, I don't know, a year ago or a few months ago is finally being looked at by the mainstream media, not as just, you know, crazy conspiracy nuts saying some other crazy things, but, oh, wow, those things really make sense now. So we're like, all right, well, where were you guys, you know, a year ago? And the evolutionary biologist, Brett Weinstein, who's been pursuing the story for months. It's hard to know how to encapsulate this so people really get it. I like to say that certain stories diagnose the system. That as you watch some system grapple with something, it reveals what it's actually made of and what it's designed to do. And the system, and by that I mean the press, the social media platforms, the ac academics who study virology or epidemiology, uh, all of these things got this story upside down and the fact of it was not even especially well hidden you know that that is why i took a risk with my reputation and came out in favor of the strong possibility that this was a lab leak i was very careful to say it's a hypothesis it still remains a hypothesis as far as i i'm concerned but this was visible increasingly that system which misleads people misleads them it dresses itself in scientific garb it uses the authority of uh, government regulatory apparatuses it silences people who disagree with it on the internet that system is about something and it isn't about us right what it is designed to do we can speculate on but the lab leak hypothesis story tells you that the system that says follow the science isn't doing science and it isn't interested in you following science what it's interested in is borrowing that authority in order to lead you into false beliefs so this is a really complex story with loads of different rabbit holes that you can go down so what we've also done is put together a really long briefing document with links and summaries which you can get a copy of if you check the show notes below and we've also published a more in-depth interview with Yuri and Brett going a bit deeper into the science at the same time as this film. So with a little bit of help from our graphic designer, this is a summary of the story so far. So when the pandemic first started in late 2019, the speculation at first was that it began at the Wuhan seafood market, but people quickly started pointing out that it was very close to the Wuhan Institute of Virology that had been working on bat coronaviruses and have been doing what's called gain of function work, which means to make them more virulent and powerful. In February 2020, a group of scientists came together to co-sign this letter in the top medical journal, The Lancet, condemning any suggestion that it came from the lab as a conspiracy theory. Shortly afterwards, this paper, Proximal Origins, by the top scientist Christian Anderson, claimed the virus was likely natural. In April 2020, Donald Trump claimed he'd seen evidence it came from a lab. The topic quickly became a political test for tribalism, with the mainstream labeling anyone who argued for the lab leak as a conspiracy theorist and Trump supporter. The consensus position was completely defended. 
But meanwhile, in the shadows, a team of independent researchers from around the world found each other online. They called themselves Drastic and produced a series of stunning revelations about the Wuhan lab, including that they deleted their database's viruses at around the time the pandemic started, and that they kept it a secret that they'd harvested multiple deadly bat viruses from a group of miners who'd contracted a SARS-like disease. It also emerged that a Chinese paper that had been published in February that had also blamed the Wuhan Institute was quickly deleted. More and more circumstantial evidence continued to mount, but the story didn't start to shift until a month ago when the former New York Times journalist Nicholas Wade published a story examining the evidence. Soon after that, the Wall Street Journal reported that three researchers at the Wuhan Institute had been taken to hospital with something that looked a lot like coronavirus in November 2019. Then once the stigma around the story had lifted, a whole series of revelations showed how the consensus had been created and how it fell apart. Vanity Fair published an epic story that quoted officials saying that even within the US government, they were told not to investigate, as it would open a whole can of worms and show how the US had been funding dangerous gain-of-function research for years. Ian Birrell in Unheard described how researchers and academics who'd argued for a lab leak had failed to get their papers published for over a year. And it also emerged that the original letter to The Lancet was coordinated by a scientist called Peter Daszak, who was intimately connected to the Wuhan Institute. And then recent emails came out from the scientist who created the Proximal Origins paper, saying that his first impression was that some of the elements of the virus had looked engineered. So I've been interested in the lab leak hypothesis for over a year. We cannot just stick with the mainstream narratives. And also some of these narratives that are being kind of seen as conspiracy are turning out to have more than a little bit of truth. The idea that the virus could have come from the lab has gone from being crazy to actually there's a lot of strong circumstantial evidence that lead us to suggest that, that there might be some truth in that. So I wanted to cover the story and thought the best way would be to have both sides. Brett Weinstein, who's been arguing for the lab leak hypothesis for months, alongside someone who opposed it. I was advised to try the Week in Virology podcast. From the beginning, they've been outspoken and strongly opposed to the lab leak hypothesis. This is how my conversation with them went. So having approached them as a journalist, this interaction was on the record. February the 10th. Hi, I'm a journalist from the UK looking into the arguments for and against the lab release hypothesis of COVID. Any recommendations on who to contact would be gratefully received. February 12th. I'm happy to talk about the science fiction. It didn't come from a lab. Those who think it did do not understand virology. No name, no signature. My response. Thanks for the response. Who am I talking to? Where are you based and how best to communicate? Four days later. Following this up, I'm finding it much easier to source people who claim it did come from a lab than the alternative. I'm guessing that's not an ideal situation from your perspective. You are speaking with Vincent Racaniello. We arranged a Zoom call for the next Monday, which he didn't turn up for and didn't let me know why. So February 23rd. Hi, Vincent. You missed our call yesterday and I haven't had a response to many of my messages. Can you please respond? This is a uniquely poor and unprofessional experience of pretty much all my time as a journalist and something I will reflect in any public writings on the topic. Friday, February the 26th. Clearly you are not interested in understanding the facts, but rather to threaten and insult me. I've genuinely never experienced anything quite like this as a journalist. I also tried multiple anti-lab leak scientists to talk about this. Most didn't respond. None would talk on the record. Eventually I spoke to one off the record, who was recommended by Vincent Racaniello, and this person didn't really know much about it, didn't know any of the background, wasn't familiar with any of the people involved, and as far as I could tell, it boiled down to viruses usually come from nature, so this one probably did too. I spoke to Brett Weinstein about this. I mean, it's obvious what's going on. This is the behavior of people who have a mission that they believe is very, very important, which cannot be defended. So the line they're giving you is designed to make you think that there is some large amount of evidence that points in the direction of a zoonotic origin. And they are right that most viruses have a zoonotic origin. I mean, essentially by definition. And, you know, ultimately SARS-CoV-2 comes from nature. Did it come through the lab and was it modified there is the question. 
viruses were taken to the Wuhan Institute of Virology and they were modified there. And so really, I keep asking the question of people who swear that it is preposterous to imagine that it came from the Wuhan Institute. And I asked the question, what is the evidence that it came from nature? No one has yet delivered me a single piece of evidence that actually points to nature. Everything that is said, all of the claims- What, what could that be, Brett? What, what evidence would, would point to it coming from nature? I well, mean, obviously the animal where it came from would be one, but is, are there other pieces that would work? Well, that's the key thing that you would look for is some plausible route. Instead, what we have are dozens of pieces of information again, of four different kinds that are inconsistent with it having come from nature or are more consistent with it having come from the lab. Nothing of the pieces of evidence, most evidence doesn't tell you one way or the other. Of the pieces of evidence that point in one direction or the other, they all point to the lab. And so that, you know, that's not conclusive. Tomorrow morning, we could get news that there are mustelids in some remote corner of China that have evidence for a pan or a, of an epidemic having circulated in them. Maybe we have tissue that has uh, a plausible ancestor to SARS-CoV-2. There are lots of things that could emerge, but at some level, the pressure on the Chinese to find that population and to present it to us is absolutely immense. I do have some concern that the pressure is so immense that there might be an attempt to um, portray evidence that doesn't actually exist, right? Mm -hmm. That is possible in 2021. I am hopeful that the existence of the drastic group means that nobody would contemplate doing this because the chances of somebody doing it without a detectable signature are low enough. But there just simply isn't any evidence that points to nature and not to the lab. And what is therefore being presented instead of evidence, as you correctly point to, is the initial presumption, right? If a new virus emerges, your initial presumption should be that it comes from nature because they mostly do. At the point that evidence starts pointing in the other direction, that presumption vanishes and you begin either to presume nothing or at some point, sufficient evidence accumulates that you begin to presume the opposite. And then the onus is on those who say this clearly came from nature. And of course, when you ask them, they behave as you found. They dart away, they create a big cloud of ink and disappear into the reef or whatever it is that they're doing. But, um, you know, it's stark. And the most amazing thing to me is after Nicholas Wade's article, which is a very good article. It covers the ground very well. It was not groundbreaking. Nicholson Baker covered the same territory much earlier. Um, but anyway, the world took Nick Nicholas Wade's article to be, you know, the case being broken. And following that, we had Ralph Barrick, who is one of the is the PI of one of the two most important labs in the world working on these. There are really only three labs, but two of them, we've got one in North Carolina, we've got one in Wuhan. Ralph Barrick is the PI of the lab that studies these viruses and engineers them in North Carolina. He is also mentor in some regard to uh, Xi Zheng Li, who is the PI of the Wuhan lab. And he came out in a paper with Alina Chan and others and said, we have to investigate the possibility of a lab leak. That's the person on earth who is most experienced with these technologies telling you there is nothing in this genome that is inconsistent with the laboratory origin. And for him to say that really tells you that all of the people who assured us this couldn't be true have been at the very, at the best case, they've been mistaken. And we now know from the emails that have been released, Fauci's emails, that many of them were just simply lying because when they looked at the genome, they also thought laboratory origin. So th those who are holding on to the idea that not only is the presumption justified that it came from nature at this point, but that anybody who thinks about the alternatives is obviously not comprehending the virology, that's preposterous. These people... And this is the behavior of useful idiots. So what we've seen over the last few months with the unfolding of this consensus is something that we don't usually see. Now we don't know for sure whether it came from a lab. We don't have categorical proof one way or the other. But from one perspective, it doesn't matter because 
What we've already found out is that it could have done. People were doing the kind of research that could have created a pandemic like this and was actually probably likely to create a pandemic like this. I want people to understand that you are simultaneously correct. In one way, it doesn't matter because whether this came from nature or from the lab, we were indeed creating frightening viruses in the lab. And if we do that long enough, one will eventually get out and create a pandemic like COVID-19 or worse. On the other hand, it does matter a great deal for two reasons. I seem to be the only person who believes that had we understood that this was a laboratory origin virus, that we would then have become focused on the protocols that generated it. And in knowing what those protocols were, we would have had a great deal of extra power in predicting the behavior and the epidemiology of this virus going forward. The virus does not behave as we expect a zoonotic virus to do. And having been able to understand that in the context of experiments that turned it into an unusual, uh, an unusual virus would have been very valuable. I also think it would have been galvanizing, where, whereas at least in the U.S., we became extremely polarized around whether we believed that this was a very dangerous virus that required us to lock down and fear each other, or others believed that it was, you know, like the flu and we needed to just go on with our lives. That was a very costly kind of division. And had we understood, if this is a laboratory origin virus, had we understood that, we would have recognized that we were dealing with something unusual, something, a virus that had been imbued with special capacities to get around our defenses, and we would have been much more sober about controlling it. I think we would have been a great deal more effective, which means that those, those who misled us, and many of them did so intentionally, those who misled us actually squandered our opportunity to control SARS-CoV-2 when we had that opportunity, and now we're playing catch-up. What has been laid bare is how the consensus was created, how it was defended, and this is something we've covered a lot on the channel. For example, Eric Weinstein in Glitch in the Matrix 2. So in general, when I hear the word consensus, my initial hit on the word consensus is negative. Why is that? It's because if everybody agrees that something is true, like two plus three equals five, you don't need a consensus. Nobody talks about the arithmetic consensus. Everybody who doesn't subscribe to the arithmetic consensus uh, goes nowhere. They can't build a house. They, they can't uh, you know, handle money. Okay, so there is no need to call it the arithmetic consensus. On the other hand, um, if things are actually open-ended, very rare for people to all bunch together around one set of tentative ideas. So what you find is that in general, you would expect a cacophony of people, each with their own pet ideas when things are genuinely uncertain, or you would find everybody falling in line when more or less it's clear that, uh, that the world goes one particular way. So in general, I think what's going on with a consensus is that a consensus is usually achieved through some sort of incentivizing people, as the, uh, as the mobs, uh, the violent mobs in Mexico say, plato o plomo, do you want silver or do you want lead? So you're given a certain amount of encouragement to come to a particular perspective, maybe in terms of grant money or speaking opportunities, and you're given a disincentive, which is this is what's going to happen to your career if you don't fall in line. And so using a plato o plomo model, you suddenly get a lot of people pretending that they all agree to some kind of consensus position. From our perspective, the important thing to pay attention to is you just watched the entire field of virology in the middle of the worst pandemic in a century sell a false story about the origin of that thing because it had conflicts of interest up the wazoo. That's a very dangerous situation. We don't have a backup field of virology. We have one. We've got a field of virology, and apparently it is entirely capable of all telling the same wrong story in unison and belittling and stigmatizing anybody who deviates from it. That's a very dangerous situation. There will be other pandemics, and we need to have independent scientists who are capable of telling us what we need to know, not what they want us to think. 
that's what they're doing. They're telling us what they want us to think. And the conflicts of interest, I mean, you're right, Eric and I have been pointing out the hazard of this, not with respect to virology in particular, but with respect to everything that matters, where something hinges on a delicate scientific conclusion. In those cases, you cannot afford to have these petty academic games where people are competing with each other for grant money and for jobs, and they learn to tell lies in order to enhance their prospects. That is putting the world in jeopardy. There's a lot to be said about what can and can't be done to fix it, but at the very least, today, we should all be able to see the world is actually literally jeopardized by the economics of these fields on which we suddenly have to depend. And the story is also about the collapse of old sense-making structures and the rise of others, what Jordan Hall talked about in our Deep Code film. The Blue Church being the establishment challenged by new sense-making structures, decentralized collective intelligence like Drastic. And I think now it's actually becoming relatively commonplace to kind of see the, the struggle between Blue Church normative good opinion and new structures of sense-making and new structures of meaning-making and new structures of how those are beginning to try to cohere into actually sovereign collective intelligences that are able to do the whole, the whole thing. Now what? And how? So the, the answer now what is decentralized collective intelligence. Great. How? How do we do that? Um, so I said first step is know that you don't know. I know that most of your habits are blue church habits. In fact, most of your habits are even game A habits, but let's just leave it at blue church right now. And certainly everything you've been formally taught and everything you've learned from formal institutions, and almost all those are going to be wrong. So you have to actually step into a pretty um, child's mind place. And as a rule of thumb, just go very slowly and don't try to come to doing, come to action very quickly. So there's so much depth to this story. As I said, so many rabbit holes you can go down, fewer insights, glycons, and all sorts of scientific terms. And if you wanna go deep, check out the document and the links that we've put together. Again, check the show notes. What I've come to realize is that almost every argument, if you follow it down to the end of that rabbit hole, comes down to a decision of who you trust. It's an appeal to authority on some level, and you've got to decide who you find credible and which narratives you find credible. Even Yuri Dagan from Drastic says, don't get too certain. What is not nice is like, yeah, the media hype. You, you understand that it's driven not by facts, it's driven by popularity, groupthink, and just, you know, the modern, I don't know, like short attention span mentality and herd mentality that is really, I think, just a big problem in the world. There's just so few independent thinkers left who are not only not afraid to think independently, they're not afraid to speak about what they really think because, you know, they're afraid of being ostracized. And these days it's so easy to get like on the wrong side of the, I don't know, the, the right crowd and you get canceled for things you might have said even like, I don't know, 20 years ago. So people are very cautious about what they're willing to say publicly. Mm -hmm. So it maybe even like took a little uh, crazy or not crazy, like people with zero uh, dams given mentality. Like, I don't care. This is what I think. And I'm, you know, I'm willing to defend my position even if you don't like it. And uh, so from that standpoint, now that it's kind of in vogue that like, oh yeah, the lab leak is, is now like the, the popular hypothesis versus the conspiracy hypothesis. I'm just worried that, you know, maybe we're gonna, maybe we're gonna miss something important about the, the natural hypothesis with all this hysteria and people will be afraid to speak up about new evidence that eventually might turn out to that, you know, maybe we're all, maybe we're all, really crazy and they're seeing things that aren't there that in the end it'll turn out that all these coincidences are just coincidence and it was a zoonotic spillover it just people you know maybe crazy like coincidences of a pangolin and a bat getting to wuhan it's possible because right now we don't have conclusive evidence and i just 
you know, a little weary of how many people seem to not only reverse their position very quickly, but also seem to give much more credence to the lab leak hypothesis than when I, I do. And uh, you'd think, you know, I'd be the guy who'd be like, yeah, it's a lab leak, but I, I want to be, I want to be very intellectually honest with myself, first and foremost, that we, we do not have conclusive proof yet. And it still could turn on a dime to be either one of the uh, possibilities of the or origins of SARS-CoV-2. So I hope you enjoyed this deep dive. It's the first of many, and we'll return to this story. And we'll also have a conversation in the Rebel Wisdom Digital Campfire on Monday with Yuri Dagin. So check below for how to join. And see you soon. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense making develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.